Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all Denarians on the go and in the know. Like, subscribe, and share with your fellow Denarian friends. To help support our channel we now accept tips using the blockchain-based Brave Browser and BAT tokens. It makes a huge difference and is very much appreciated. To those of you that made a contribution, I sincerely thank you very much. If you have not done so yet, pick up your free trial copy of the Currency Exchange Planner and check out the awesome new Currency Exchange Planner Companion, voted the number one exchange planner in the Dinar community for a reason. Both the links to the powerful secure blockchain Brave browser as well as the Currency Exchange Planner are in the description box below this video. Today we are going to go deeper into the upcoming digital dollar and cover how the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury just became one working unit headed by your President Donald Trump. The world is changing dramatically around us. Welcome to the storm. It will be better on the other side. The greatest transfer of wealth is taking place right now before our eyes. With that said, let us get started. First article of interest for today. How a flurry of digital dollar proposals made it to Congress. The digital dollar took just eight days to get into the U.S. Congress. Advocates for digitizing coronavirus relief payments began working with congressional staffers earlier this month to outline how the Federal Reserve could potentially distribute funds to unbanked individuals quickly as the country's economic downturn worsened. Morgan Ricks, an associate professor at Vanderbilt Law School, told Coindesk that a provision detailing the digital dollar into different bills from the House of Representatives reflected assistance that he along with Columbia University fellow Lev Menon and University of California Hastings Law Professor John Crawford, provided. The group has long advocated for a digital dollar, writing a paper in 2018 on the subject and a Bloomberg opinion piece earlier this week. Ricks told Coindesk in a phone call Wednesday that he had been working with staffers since around March 17. Ricks refused to specify which House staffers he had worked with. A digital wallet with the Fed would be a relatively easy way of distributing funds, Ricks said. Still, while the bills painted the initiative as an urgent one targeted at providing immediate relief to U.S. residents, Ricks said the process might take some time. The ultimate vision here is that at some point down the road, probably next year, People really would have a direct account with the Fed consisting of digital money and there wouldn't be any other intermediary bank, Rick said. The Fed doesn't have that retail capability right now. State-level advisors may also be assisting, said Sheila Warren, head of blockchain and distributed ledger technology at the World Economic Forum. That Congress was thinking about digital currencies after last year's Libra hearings is not a surprise, she said. The fact that it even got that far means there's already a lot of behind-the-scenes action happening that's already working on this, she said. The language first appeared, and was then promptly stripped from one of two House bills, on Monday and is likely to be dropped from the other House bill. Then the digital dollar roared back to life with its own dedicated draft bill before the U.S. Senate. That bill was introduced Monday by Senator Sherrod Brown. D. Ohio, who is also the ranking member on the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs. Vanderbilt as Rick said he had not seen the Senate version and was not working with Brown's office. At the height of this pandemic we must do more to protect the financial well-being of hard-working Americans and consumers, Brown said in a statement. They are on the front lines of this crisis and are already feeling the effects of the economic fallout. A source familiar with the effort said Brown's office intends to pursue the legislation, currently sitting before the Senate Banking Committee. Banking the Unbanked In a statement, Brown painted the proposal as one aimed at helping unbanked or underbanked individuals access financial services, a goal many crypto projects, including the Facebook led Libra stablecoin effort, likewise target. My legislation would allow every American to set up a free bank account so they don't have to rely on expensive check cashers to access their hard-earned money, Brown said. 
These concerns are not unfounded. According to the New York Times, the final relief bill, which both the House and the Senate passed, allows the federal government to send the payments only to eligible American taxpayers with direct deposit bank addresses on file with the Internal Revenue Service. Eligible recipients who don't have an address on file or whose address is outdated may have to wait for or more months. Indeed, the bill itself states that funds will be dispersed electronically to any account which the PAE authorized for tax refunds on or after January 1st. 2018. Taxpayers will be notified no more than 15 days after the funds are distributed that they received the payment via mail. Such notice shall indicate the method by which such payment was made, the amount of such payment, and a phone number for the appropriate point of contact at the Internal Revenue Service to report any failure to receive such payment, the bill said. According to the Times, this means roughly 70 million people will actually receive a payment in the coming weeks. The U.S. population is just under 330 million. The digital dollar proposals would prevent banks offering wallets from requiring a minimum balance, as well as provide reasonable protection against losses caused by fraud or security breaches, Brown's bill said. Next steps. Future progress on the concept could take a while. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, our guy, has recessed the legislative chamber until April 20, meaning no votes are expected before next month, barring any emergencies. A project of this scale shouldn't be rushed either, said Warren, who was named Thursday as an advisor to the Digital Dollar Foundation launched by Christopher Jane Carlo and Daniel Gore Fine, former officials at the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Warren told Coindesk she remains skeptical as to the use case for a digital dollar issued by the Fed, but is especially concerned with a potential rush job. You can't do it that quickly and be smart about it, she said, describing an emergency tinged deployment as a non-starter. Paper checks may not be ideal, but the idea we could suddenly pivot is not realistic. One of Warren's concerns is that any short-term, Privacy invading tools may remain a permanent fixture. I don't think it's ever temporary, I think it becomes permanent very quickly, she said. David Reed, a senior managing director at Accenture, told Coindesk that from a practical viewpoint, there would need to be a massive push to collect the necessary information from individuals to set up a distribution system. The U.S. has chosen as a society to not make use of national identifiers meaning individuals would therefore have to register for a bank account should a digital dollar be built. Accenture is working with the Digital Dollar Foundation to pursue a potential solution for a U.S. central bank digital currency, but Treat noted that this would be more helpful in a future crisis. You need to focus on what's currently available, he said. Next article of interest. Accenture interview. Why a digital dollar can't be rushed. This week the concept of a digital dollar hit the headlines as the U.S. Democrats floated the idea of electronically distributing COVID-19 stimulus money to the unbanked. However, there is already a quite different digital dollar project initiated by former Commodity Futures Trading Commission, CFDC, Chair Chris Jane Carlo that's exploring the potential for a U.S. central bank digital currency, CBDC, in partnership with Accenture. David Reed, colleague of Accenture's blockchain business and a director of the Digital Dollar Project, spoke to Ledger Insights about the initiative, which aims to create a public-private partnership to come up with a design suitable for the U.S. In the context of the COVID-19 crisis, given the urgency of getting funds to those in need, is a CBDC a practical option? It is not something that can be done in weeks, said Dreed. We're at the beginning of this journey in terms of what we're calling a digital dollar. And Accenture should know because it has been consulting central banks on the topic for years, including in Canada, Singapore, Sweden and Europe. However, while the timing may be off, Dreek commented that a modern form of the dollar would help to better respond to crises like the current one. A digital dollar can mean many different things. 
The digital dollar project defines it as a tokenized form of central bank digital currency that would be distributed via the two-tier banking system. Treat described it as, having it, dollars, be minted, if you will, through the Fed and Treasury, and then distributed out to the commercial bank infrastructure, to then be distributed onwards to retail endpoints. Being able to operate within the current structures is vastly more efficient and practical, said Treat. Not everyone believes that distributed ledger technology, DLT, is needed to implement a CBDC, and some think it's not sufficiently scalable. While Accenture is open to evaluating all options, Street favors DLT. That ability to have a unique object in the digital world. The notion of a shared ledger to be able to have that control and confidence and auditability and transparency, according to the policies of the ecosystem, are all incredibly powerful. And seem to be the right answer, said Dreed. Coming back to the potential for a framework, it will also include addressing digital identity and the wallet infrastructure to store the digital currency. A digital dollar for remittances, financial inclusion. At a high level, the purpose of a digital dollar is to make sending money as easy as sending a text or photo. In terms of applications, an important one is remittances for foreign workers sending money home. The World Bank figures show an average remittance cost of 6.8%. Dree commented that it can be as much as the high teens or even in extreme cases, 20% or more. This is charging an exorbitant fee to the people who can least afford to pay it. Ledger Insights found the World Bank figures show a huge variation in fees, with online transactions to some destinations quite cost-effective. By comparison, transfers involving physical cash and visiting a money transfer company are expensive. Street pointed to the frequent lack of a bank account requiring the use of cash. And access to bank accounts is linked to identity and having a fixed place to live. So addressing the digital literacy on financial literacy aspects is absolutely important, said Dreed. But, the whole notion of digital identity is incredibly important to participate fully in our financial ecosystem. He pointed to other countries that have centralized digital identity systems but doesn't see that happening in the U.S. The focus from a financial inclusion perspective is, how do you get effective digital identity into the hands of those with none? And how do you, through education and access, enable those that have an identity but no direct access to the financial system, to get one? Asked Reed. He continued, how do you employ mechanisms that we've used for things like food stamps and other benefits distribution approaches to reach those people that currently don't participate directly in the financial infrastructure? In terms of use cases, remittances are the smaller end of cross-border payments but there are also challenges for larger transactions. Use cases for cross-border payments, SME retail payments. The problems with cross-border payments are well documented and include the need for intermediary banks where a bank doesn't have an account at the payment destination. The multi-hop payments are expensive and slow things down, especially if there's a query. It is also incredibly costly and inefficient, said Dreed. Several solutions aim to address the status messaging issues, including Ripple in it, Swift's B and JP Morgan's interbank information network. But with tokenized central bank money, the transfer is direct and there's no need to maintain numerous accounts around the world. A third use case relates to small retailers that invariably accept cash and cards. But as more retail moves online, Cards are the primary option and carry relatively high fees. And small business owners are less able to afford these charges. From a consumer perspective, a digital token might not appear much different to using Zelle or Venmo but potentially could significantly cut fees for SME retailers. The Digital Dollar Project has just announced a 22-member advisory board and, notably, both Visa and MasterCard are represented. While the use cases seem compelling, the big question is whether there's an appetite for digital currency. Is there demand? Treat noted that from a central bank perspective, there has been a dramatic uptick in interest in the past year. Perhaps that's driven in part by Facebook's Libra.
a BIS survey of central banks confirms this elevated enthusiasm. But the other side of the equation is consumers. Um, Fifan Ipsos Mori recently conducted a survey of citizens across 13 nations. Asia demonstrated a far bigger appetite for digital currencies compared to the West. And it's favored more by younger, wealthier males. In the vast majority of countries, the central bank was the preferred issuer of digital currency. But not in the U.S. where payment processors such as PayPal or Apple pipped the Federal Reserve. Although for both the payment firms and the central bank, more survey respondents were negative rather than positive. And for a CBDC, the only country with a more negative sentiment than the U.S. was Italy. Despite these results, it's a reasonable question to ask whether the average survey respondent understands the difference between a stable coin and a central bank digital currency. Digitizing the world's reserve currency While the requirements of a central bank digital currency are unique to every country, the fact that the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency makes it more important. The usefulness of having a dominant reserve currency and the consistency and stability that drives on a global basis has been quite helpful in the development of how our globally interconnected financial system has worked. A digital dollar offers massive potential benefits in trade and financial markets but also risks for other economies if non-U.S. citizens decide to hold U.S. dollars en masse. Recognizing this, Street said, part of our focus is to move slowly and deliberately. There is no need to move fast and be first. We want to make sure that we get it right. And the final most important article for today. The Fed's cure risks being worse than the disease. The Fed took unprecedented action to meet an unprecedented crisis. Is it dangerous? The economic debate of the day centers on whether the cure of an economic shutdown is worse than the disease of the virus. Similarly, we need to ask if the cure of the Federal Reserve getting so deeply into corporate bonds, asset-backed securities, commercial paper, and exchange-traded funds is worse than the disease seizing financial markets. It may be. In just these past few weeks, the Fed has cut rates by 150 basis points to near zero and run through its entire 2008 crisis handbook. That wasn't enough to calm markets. Though, so the central bank also announced $1 trillion a day in repurchase agreements and unlimited quantitative easing, which includes a hard-to-understand $625 billion of bond buying a week going forward. At this rate, the Fed will own two-thirds of the Treasury market in a year. But it's the alphabet soup of new programs that deserve special consideration, as they could have profound long-term consequences for the functioning of the Fed and the allocation of capital in financial markets. Specifically, these are CPFF, Commercial Paper Funding Facility, Buying Commercial Paper from the Issuer, PMCCF, Primary Market Corporate Credit Facility, Buying Corporate Bonds from the Issuer, TALF, term asset-backed securities loan facility, funding backstop for asset-backed securities, SMCCF, secondary market corporate credit facility, buying corporate bonds and bond ETFs in the secondary market, MSBLP, Main Street Business Lending Program, details are to come, but it will lend to eligible small and medium-sized businesses, complementing efforts by the Small Business Association. To put it bluntly, the Fed isn't allowed to do any of this. The central bank is only allowed to purchase or lend against securities that have government guarantee. This includes treasury securities, agency mortgage-backed securities and the debt issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. An argument can be made that can also include municipal securities, but nothing in the laundry list above. So how can they do this? The Fed will finance a special purpose vehicle, SPV for each acronym to conduct these operations. The Treasury, using the Exchange Stabilization Fund, will make an equity investment in each SPV and be in a first loss position. What does this mean? In essence, the Treasury, not the Fed, is buying all these securities and backstopping of loans. The Fed is acting as banker and providing financing.
the Fed hired BlackRock Incorporated to purchase these securities and handle the administration of the SPVs on behalf of the owner, the Treasury. In other words, the federal government is nationalizing large swaths of the financial markets. The Fed is providing the money to do it. BlackRock will be doing the trades. This scheme essentially merges the Fed and Treasury into one organization. So, meet your new Fed chairman, Donald J. Trump. In 2008 when something similar was done, it was on a smaller scale. Since few understood it, the Bush and Obama administration ceded total control of those acronym programs to then-Fed chairman Ben Bernanke. He unwound them at the first available opportunity. But now, 12 years later, we have a much better understanding of how they work. And we have a president who has made it very clear how displeased he is that central bankers haven't used their considerable power to force the Dow Jones Industrial Average at least 10,000 points higher, something he has complained about many times before the pandemic hit. When the Fed was rightly alarmed by the current dysfunction in the fixed income markets, they felt they needed to act. This was the correct thought. But, to get the authority to stabilize these private markets, central bankers needed the Treasury to agree to nationalize, own, them so they could provide the funds to do it. In effect, the Fed is giving the Treasury access to its printing press. This means that, in the extreme, the administration would be free to use its control, not the Fed's control, of these SPVs to instruct the Fed to print more money so it could buy securities and hand out loans in an effort to ramp financial markets higher going into the election. Why stop there? Should Trump win re-election, he could try to use these SPVs to get those 10,000 Dow Jones points he feels the Fed has denied everyone. If these acronym programs were abused as I describe, they might indeed force markets higher than valuation warrants. But it would come with a heavy price. Investors would be deprived of the necessary market signals that freely traded capital markets offer to aid in the efficient allocation of capital. Malinvestment would be rampant. It also could force private sector players to leave as the government's heavy hand makes operating in, controlled, markets uneconomic. This has already occurred in the U.S. federal funds market and the government bond market in Japan. Fed Chair Jerome Powell needs to tread carefully in D to ensure his cure isn't worse than the disease. If you liked today's video hit the like and subscribe buttons to be notified as new ones are posted. Check out the Denarian blog, Facebook and Twitter for all of today's articles of interest. Pick up your free trial copy of the newly upgraded Currency Exchange Planner and check out the new Currency Exchange Planner Companion before you leave. Use the promo code, the Denarian, and get 25% off at checkout when you decide to unleash the full planner's abilities, along with the mobile application added free for being my subscriber. Register today as an affiliate with the Gold Savings Carrot Bar program. If you do not keep your savings in a real asset like gold, you risk everything as the fiat system fails and they boot up the new quantum financial system on the blockchain. Protect your family's wealth today in physical gold, as tomorrow may be too late. The program is made so everyone can afford to save in gold, by offering it one gram at a time. Start saving in a real true asset like gold, it's free to register and secure your family's savings tomorrow. Why do you think all the central banks are loading up on gold lately, and running from the current depreciating fiat US dollar? Do you think they do not know what is coming? Get yourself protected. Both of the links to these invaluable programs are available in the description box below this video, go check them out, knowledge is power, using that newfound knowledge is powerful. Over and out, for now, the day.